Fight Commentary Breakdowns, Jerry. This is a Fight Commentary Chats episode. We have a very awesome guest. He's a martial artist, a filmmaker, an archaeologist, and he's an author. In fact, today we're going to talk about one of the books he's co-authored. So, Patrick, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. We should start by talking a little about this book. This book is super, super interesting. I've already learned a lot reading the first two chapters. For viewers that are not familiar, this is a book that has martial arts in it, but it's also about the what we call the Romani people. But from reading the book, Patrick, I realized the Romani people call themselves Rum, right? So they don't usually go Roma, like how I used to call them, or Romani, they just say Rum. It varies. There's Rome or the Rome, which can be a singular. It can also be like a collective plural. Roma is often the plural. Both are acceptable. It'll kind of vary depending on who's talking, what context they're using. And then Romany is often a description. You'll often hear like Romany or Romany ethnic group or as a description, Romany language. It's often used as a descriptor, but you might be more likely to hear Rom or Roma from a Romany person. By the second chapter of the book, I learned that there's different groups, right? And in there, there was like the Ger Germanic Romani people, and then the, uh, I think it was the Romanian Romani people, and the main character was talking about how, oh yeah, and they kind of overstayed their welcome. So I was like, wow, there's different groups. We usually just kind of lump oh, them yeah. into one group. So that's the perfect time to kind of just talk about the history. A lot of people don't even know where the Romani people come from. People's kind of biggest perception for media is either from one Guy Ritchie movie or from The Hunchback of Notre Dame. I think those are the oh, two yeah. media <laughs> references people have when it comes mm -hmm. to thinking about the Romani people. So this is a perfect time to just really talk a little bit about the Romani people. So I'll give the stage to you, Patrick. I'm an archaeologist. I'm pursuing a PhD at University College London. And my thesis is, to my knowledge, the first doctoral thesis about the archaeology of the Romani people. The Romani people originated in Rajasthan, India. That's what the region is called today. That's where their ancestors originated, I should say. This was determined through linguistic evidence and then confirmed through genetic evidence. The leading theory is that they were pushed out by Muslim conquests or the collapse of the Ghaznavid kingdoms, which ruled a lot of India and Afghanistan, and they were pushed west, eventually making their way through Iran, through Armenia, then into the Byzantine Empire. And the Byzantine Empire is a critical divergence point because that's where they formed their own language. The Romani language is mostly Hindi and Greek. Those are the two biggest contributors. That's when they started to form new craft traditions, new cultural practices. And that's when we can really say that these are early Roma or old, early Romani people, as opposed to proto-Roma, which is a lot of times what you'll call the, you know, the Indian tribes as they were moving westward. From there, they spread out throughout Europe. There's so many different stages to this history. It's fascinating. One of the biggest ones and one of the most important ones to keep in mind is that for 500 years, they were enslaved in what is now Romania. The kingdoms of Wallachia and Moldovia, um, they were kept as slaves in on ethnic grounds. It's not like they were just incidentally slaves. The law strictly said only, quote, gypsies can be slaves. So that's a dark part of their history and um, one that doesn't get talked about nearly enough. Um, if you ask Europeans about this, they're more likely to have learned about uh, slavery in America than they are to have learned about slavery in Europe of the Roma. Hungary is also an interesting one. Roma and Hungary, they became a sort of royal serf. They actually had more privileges than the peasants because their metalworking skills were so valued. Uh, that's in Eastern Europe, that's their main thing is metalworking, especially blacksmithing. So for a while, they actually had it pretty decent in Hungary until a new regime came to power. They had issues with them. And that's honestly a, a pattern that happens a lot. You identified something uh, very well. Yes, our book does acknowledge different groups of Roma. Um, in our story, both Mila and and Simon, the character you're talking about, are they're both technically Romanian Roma, but they traveled at different times. And this can be a real distinction because there was a wave of migration in the early 19th century when Roma were first uh, freed from slavery. Then you have additional waves of migration following the fall of communism. So Mila, the main character, his family, they came to Germany after the fall of the Iron Curtain. Simon, 
His family has been in Romania a lot longer during a period when, as the book will explain, discrimination got a lot worse, actually. After the Iron Curtain went down, their ethnic integration policies went out the window, and a lot of Romani people were just fired en masse from their jobs and just left to live on the streets. So that's where Simon is coming from. He's coming from several more decades of that abuse. There are over 50 different subgroups of Roma, by the way, or Romani people. That's a perfect discussion point that you just brought up, because when I was doing some research, just to know more about the background of the Romani people, I was just looking, I was like, wow, there's a lot of groups, including in the United States, when you and I are from, there's Romani people too that we don't even know. I, mean, I don't mm -hmm. even think census figures really look at Romani people in the US like in Europe they do. So it's just really interesting that, like you said, there's so many subgroups and that's a nuance that gets lost when, for example, back in the 90s or whenever people called them gypsy right it's like it's mm. the same thing for example you call people latinos you call people asians you just <laughs> lose the nuance of the fact that there's a lot of different groups of people mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know that there are roma in america and a lot of times europeans will even try and dismiss american roma as if they're this small group but actually there are about a million roma in the united states there are more roma in the united states than there are in a lot of european countries actually in terms of sheer numbers you don't notice them as much because we have 300 million people in america so actually my co-author in this book he is an american roma his ancestors they have been in this country for well over 100 years he is an activist he's the one who introduced me to the roma culture i would not be doing this phd if it wasn't for him i wouldn't have known about any of this we wanted to write this book to do two things, to inspire Romani people, to help them see past the kind of limitations society imposes on them, and also to represent them to the broader populace to break down prejudices that people may have. I think that's great. And even just reading the first two chapters, I've already learned so much and a lot of nuance. Patrick, I think that is a perfect little segue to introduce the co-author of the book, George Eli. Tell me about how you met him. I was a film major. In my, in my undergraduate years. So I actually met him working on a screenplay. It was part of his whole media representation thing for Romani people. He wants to create positive role models, positive representation to combat all the prejudice and misunderstanding and even the internalized stigma that some Romani people have. So we wrote that screenplay, we worked on a TV pilot, we did some fundraisers, we did all sorts of stuff. And then eventually, he pitches to me this book. He has a funny way of doing it. He pitches to me the book as if it's already been written and it's something he's just learned about. So he's like, oh, there's this new fantasy novel. It's about Romani people. And I'm like, oh, really? Oh, we should have written that. And he gives me the details. I'm like, I mean, that sounds cool, but I wish it was written by Romani people. And he's like, guess what? It's gonna be with, with me and with your help because it's, I made it up. And I'm like, that's a great idea. You guys just started writing yep. together. Yeah, absolutely. How long did it take to write the book? years. Oh my God. And there's so many revisions, so many things. So one thing you got to understand about, about George and about our working style is George is a brilliant man. I think he's a borderline genius, but he did not have a formal education because a lot of Roma, particularly in America, they're afraid of assimilation. They're afraid of losing their identity and their culture. And it's, it's not a baseless fear because historically a lot of so-called integration programs they weren't interested in maintaining the Roman identity. They really did want to assimilate them and just have them fade into nothingness. So because of that fear, he only went to the fifth grade in terms of his education. You wouldn't realistically necessarily know it talking to him because he's, he's very astute, very knowledgeable, but it does limit his writing ability. So one of my main con contributions was I bridged that gap. And then I had knowledge of story structure from my film majoring. And so between George and I, uh, he brings a lot of great understanding of human nature and his sense of drama because he's he loves movies too. Movies are how he often relates to people. And then I bring a lot of that technical stuff, that story structure, and you know, certain original ideas of my own. So we would go back and forth. Like he would have an idea and I would hate it. And then I would come up with another idea and he would hate my alternate idea. But then through that back and forth, most of the time we would come to something better than either of us thought of to begin with. That sounds like you guys have a good groove and with any type of partnership or any type of co-authorship, that's the perfect way to go. Let those little bits of clash just turn into something better. 
Yeah. Now is a perfect time to segue to talk about a little bit martial arts because that's how you sure. found me and that's how we got yeah. in touch. So yeah. from my understanding, besides doing Muay Thai and Kung Fu, you started out with something called Jikido. <laughs> <laughs> I I barely remember Jikido. There were some jujitsu moves involved, like there was Osotagami and uh, there were arm bars involved. Um, it was almost exclusive. It was very self-defense oriented, just like, how do you get out of this hold? How do you get out of that hold? And looking back, I think some of the moves are, bullshit, honestly, like, I, like there, there was like, someone holds you around the neck like this and he's like, oh, just step forward. It's like, that's not going to work. <laughs> you can't just step forward. Like you have to do more than that. Um, but it was interesting. Um, you know, I did after that use the arm bar, my older brother several times. So the really fun part relating to what I just jumped at is that you did wushu, so kung fu, under a pretty famous Chinese actor who I didn't even know started teaching and I didn't even know he ended up in the West. So for those of you who've seen a lot of early Jet Li movies, this actor was in it. His name was Hu Jianqiang. So you trained with Hu Jianqiang. Yes, yes, I did. I went to what I would describe as a hippie private school for the last two years of my high school. And they had enough of a budget that they could get a guy like this to be their Kung Fu instructor. We had like a mandatory extracurricular and that was my mandatory curricular was Kung Fu. That was a lot of fun. He was a great guy to work with. It was a good foundation, I think, for my later martial arts training. We had a lot of the exhibition stuff, like we did bow staff, we did forms, but we also did practical stuff like the basics of how to throw a roundhouse kick, how to throw a straight kick, the jab cross, the hook. It was very much a traditional martial arts instruction, and it does give me some insights into kind of the traditional versus modern martial arts debate. Um, Cause I'll definitely, I'll defend uh, that training as a very good foundation. I think later styles I took really took me well beyond that. How many years did you do Kung Fu? Only about two years. Two years. Okay. So yeah. um, in my opinion, probably two years is enough. So I'm glad you didn't go down so long because then you would have been like Jerry and feel like, oh my God, why do you spend so much time? But you know, what's done is done, right? So you then went into Muay Thai. Mm -hmm. Yes, my first Muay Thai was at an LA boxing part of that franchise when I was about 18, just after high school. And that really gave me an introduction to a lot more uh, fighting stuff. I was so excited to learn Muay Thai because there was this show Human Weapon on the History Channel, and they would have these two guys do different styles of martial arts for a week. And the Muay Thai episode, it just made sense. It's like, of course, like if that's the hardest part of your body, you should use it to fight. That was also when I first started to really spar with people, which was a lot of fun and, you know, a whole new experience. Anyone who is interested in martial arts and has never sparred, you gotta spar. And one of the things you learned very quickly from sparring is a lot of the stuff you think will work just doesn't work until you get to a really high level. But until you get to that <laughs> level, basically 90% of the stuff doesn't work. <laughs> You're stuck <laughs> literally covering up, running away, and doing your simple little stuff. Yep. I got my interest back into martial arts, one through Quan Kicker, giving him a shout out, but two, also through Human Weapon. It's kind of funny. I remember <laughs> watching clips of it because when it first came out, YouTube was just starting. So a lot of their Human Weapon clips would end up on YouTube. And so I would see little segments and it would be so enlightening because I grew up thinking Kung Fu was everything. I didn't realize there were all these other styles and all that. So it's so funny. Human Weapon kind of really inspired both of us. So after LA Boxing, I went on and off for a few years, depending on the availability of gyms. So I usually had a gym I could go through throughout undergrad. I was in the Yale Muay Thai Club when I was doing my master's degree in archaeology. And I'm now in the UCL Muay Thai Club. I'm actually, I have a sparring session tomorrow. And that's kind of funny because, you know, when you think I went to University of Pennsylvania, so we're both Ivy Leaguers, right? You don't think of Ivy Leaguers as, oh my God, do martial arts and stuff like that. But <laughs> even at Penn, there we had a Capoeira club. We had a very active Taekwondo club. We had a very active karate club. So tell me about martial arts at Yale. Was Muay Thai a big thing or was it kind of a small thing? Uh, I think it was a, a relatively small, close-knit club. I feel like you can you can judge the size of a club based on how much space they give you. And they didn't give us a whole lot of space. On a, a given day, there would probably be under 20 people actually there training because more than 20, we'd have trouble fitting them all. In the whole club, I don't know, like maybe 50 people that showed up at various times. So it was kind of like a small, close-knit club, which is good because then you can really get to know people. The thing that people always forget about 
Ivy League schools, just from my experience, is people there, even though they're smart, they also work hard at many other things, including partying or, you know, martial <laughs> arts. So I'm sure you had some very talented sparring partners. There was this one guy, uh, his name was Jordan. Um, I, I, I never landed a single blow on him. He, I mean, it helped that he was very tall, very wiry. Uh, but he was also just very good and very good at faking you out. Like you would think you're you're about to go for him and you couldn't. Like he, he'd do these moves with his hips and his shoulders and you have like your entire sense of what was coming next would be gone. And then next thing you know, there's an overhand right just slamming into you. From my understanding, one of the videos that really got you into my channel was the one where I talked about the problem with Chinese martial arts. Right? Was that the one that you discovered my channel on or was that just one that really resonated with you? So the way I discovered your channel is it started with just learning about Zhu Zhodong. There's a, a link to one of yours in the YouTube. So I followed up on that and saw some of that material. And it was really fascinating the back and forth that you have on your channel between criticisms of traditional Chinese martial arts and also examples of people like Chilala who are trying to advance them. What really made me like get hooked and what really made me want to reach out were the Chilala fights. When I first saw Chilala, I didn't even know which one was Chilala, right? If you look at the first video ever when I covered yeah. Chilala, we thought yeah. it was the other guy because we're like, this name sounds very Japanese. Who's the more Japanese looking one in the two in the <laughs> MMA fight? And we called it wrong. And then we're like, whoa, wait, why does the other guy look like he's doing more Wing Chun? So yeah, it's really <laughs> funny. Our journey, like you said, both with Chilala and Shusha, I don't because when I started out and it wasn't completely my fault. I just didn't like Xu Xiaodong. I thought he was just a bully. I thought he just liked to pick on people. And to a very small extent, that was true. But again, he was just very much misunderstood. And I think because his social media was taken down, he didn't really get a voice to really talk in the West until he figured out how to create a YouTube channel. And then, of course, once we dug up all the crazy drama with social credit and all that, then it's like, okay, we're on his side. But with Silale, it was kind of the same. It's like, at first I was like, okay, okay. The Wing Chun guy, but then as you dig deeper into his history, you're like, wow, this guy really, really cares about martial arts training. And he's also really trying to see how he can apply something, right? He's not just giving up on his Wing Chun. So, yeah, both of them are such fascinating people. And I wish Xu Xiaodong could fight more, but, you know, he's kind of limited right now. He doesn't have really any say in a lot of things, but I do enjoy his rants and stuff like that. These Xu Xiaodong fights where he's taking on these masters and some of them... It sounds like, because um, you, you know the backstory more, more than me. So some of them, it sounds like they're they're total frauds. They're they're they like they shouldn't be calling themselves masters. In other cases, it seems like some of them they're respected as masters and as instructors. But when they finally step into the ring, it's clear they're not even on his level. It's terrible what's been done to Zhu Zhodong. He doesn't deserve the backlash he's gotten or to be censored by the CPP. I think that's terrible. But looking at his his approach and his demeanor. If this were a kung fu movie, he'd be the villain. And I think that's why people are fascinated watching it is because it doesn't seem to embody those aspects of the martial arts that I think we agreed are very important. Like he's not respectful to his opponents. He does kind of show off. I imagine people that like they they really love the traditional martial arts. They even love them more than we do. Like they, they want nothing more than to see him him lose. But the thing is, reality gets in the way. It's at the end of the day, martial arts are not magic. They can't change the laws of physics. They can't change, you know, your age and the fact that your bones get brittle as you get older. These guys, you got to admit, they have heart. Like they keep getting up. It would probably help Zhu Zhong so much if he would respect the fact that they got in the ring with you. Because like, I sure shouldn't get in the ring with him. <laughs> like that takes guts. That takes courage. Some of them might just be in it for the money. Some of them might just be in it for the fame. And that's not something to admire. It's not necessarily something to disrespect either, but it's not something to admire. But if they're in it to challenge them, Themselves, that deserves a measure of admiration and respect too. To Ding Hao's credit, Xu Xiaodong even said later on in an interview, and I think I can still find the interview, but of course the interview was taken off Chinese social media, but it probably is somewhere on YouTube. He even said that out of all the traditional martial artists he's fought, Ding Hao hit the hardest. So Xu yeah. give him that credit. Unfortunately, Ding Hao's excuses and everything kind of made yeah. people not give him credit because yo it, it was rigged his yeah. master said things about oh they didn't feed us enough and you know all this stupid stuff and uh, of course the ref yeah. making it a tie but still yeah. Xu Dong initially said look Ding Hao did hit the hardest out of all the kung fu people I've ever mm -hmm. sparred with or fought to be fair to Xu Dong, like if the if the quote masters are going to be such sore losers like that that's also not embodying traditions of the martial arts that we kind of grew up with of, of that's not being respectful either that's not being honest 
Um, so that's a problem too. Yeah, like I remember watching that. And I remember at the very beginning, he does this blitz of blows. They're very fast. And like that blitz would take me down. I have no doubt. But that thing is like Zhu Zhadong, he just turtles up, he takes them all. And it shows that there are useful things in there that just need to be refined and need to be pressure tested. Like, I love yeah. what you said about that blitz because when he was doing that blitz, he was punching at a variety of areas of Xu Xiaodong too. So you can see he wasn't just going this, right? He was punching yeah. at a variety. And Xu Xiaodong was just like, okay, I'm bigger. Okay, I've taken it many times. I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, and you know what? It feels like it is in that, it is in that world where he's expecting someone to try and block all of them by hand instead of just, you know, putting your, putting your, arms and elbows up in a cage that will just deflect or block most of them automatically. The problem with this is that you leave your sides open, right? So if the Wing Chun person just incorporated a few hooks, he might have mm -hmm. actually hit yeah. Xu Xiaodong hard enough that Xu Xiaodong had yeah. to go like this or maybe had to back up or clinch or something. But because yeah. his training was so linear due to Wing Chun philosophy, it didn't occur to him because the thing is, I don't think there was a rule in that fight that you couldn't hit the back of the head, right? The mm -hmm. problem is if you cover up, even boxers do this, they'll try to go around your guard. Inevitably, mm -hmm. it's going to hit the back of your head. A hook, mm -hmm. when they're not aiming for the front of your face, but aiming for the side, yeah. because of the glove, it's going to hit the back of your head. Yeah, I got, your... I got tagged like that in sparring a little yeah. while ago. Yeah, yeah. getting yeah. your head brain a little shook from the back is, ugh. it's like, mm -hmm. ugh. it's a weird feeling. Yeah. You're used to the punches coming yeah. this way, but having this yeah. part of the back of the head move, it's weird. So I don't yeah, know, yeah. I'm sure Xu Xiaodong has experienced that knowing how much he spars yeah. with gloves on, but still, because Ding Hao doesn't spar that way and he doesn't have many hooks in his Wing Chun, he didn't understand, oh, maybe incorporate a few hooks in your blitz and a few uppercuts, but then it would look mm -hmm. like boxing. And then, oh, that's not Wing Chun, see? This puts the debate full circle. And the whole thing got me thinking back to Master Who and, you know, wondering like how combat effective were his skills. So I don't know what he's up to now. He might be retired. He mostly looking at his stuff was an exhibition, you know, Kung Fu master. I, I don't think I could find any sparring bouts of his anywhere. I still think he had fighting ability to be sure because he was jacked. Every muscle, like when, when we would be practicing stuff, I would be like, oh my God, like it's rock hard, like arms, legs, chest, rock hard. So I have no doubt he could, he could throw a punch that'll, that would wreck a normal person and he could throw it fast. But at the end of the day, he's still very short. I don't think he was much over five feet tall. You know, he's an older guy. So there's only so far you can take it. And to a point like these contests with these older, these aging masters, it's like the Chinese fairy tales aren't true. The venerable master cannot defeat any younger person. The, the younger person has a huge advantage if they're trained well enough and big enough and strong enough, they're still gonna win. And I think more of these contests should be more about like, not this master for Xu Zhaodong, it should be this master's best student who's like done some sparring and maybe in some matches versus Xu Zhaodong. Cause then that still, that does demonstrate the value of the tradition to show that it can still produce a competent fighter. And that's why after Xu Xiaodong started getting censored, you saw all these other fighters who knew how to tread more carefully. So for example, that guy Ahu we featured a few times, he, beat up Ding Hao and he was smaller. And then he also fought the guy, Ma Bao Guo, the Tai Chi guy that called the cops on Xu Xiaodong to get out of the fight. He fought that guy's best student. People have been learning from Xu Xiaodong, not doing it completely correctly and finding a better way of showing people yeah. that, oh, okay, yeah, uh, question, question. <laughs> Do you think there could ever be a fight between Xu Xiaodong and Chilala? So I've asked Chilala about this and he doesn't mind, but the mm. thing is, I think realistically, it's going to be hard because I'm not even talking about the travel. I'm just talking about the fact that Silala is way smaller. Like, mm -hmm. Silala is smaller than me. So, oh, okay. and Xu Xiaodong is oh, way bigger than me. So, even uh, okay. I would never, ever, ever want to get into even a sparring session with Xu. I don't know how much he goes berserk. I do not think it's going to be possible. Silala mm. probably, I would say, if he really bulks up, he'll fight at the 155 pound. Mm -hmm. Xu Xiaodong usually is more than 200 pounds. Mm, so it's going to be really hard for Xu Xiaodong yeah. either to cut that weight or chill out to gain that weight. So unfortunately, this well, match yeah. won't happen unless we want a freak show match. Yeah, it wouldn't be very... Um... I mean, maybe a little light sparring between them. Yeah, yeah, yeah like a little a light full, sparring. A full-on match is not 
yeah, with those strings. Or may, I don't know, like maybe Chi Lala can like train someone who's much bigger than himself, and then then that guy can go against Yu Yeah, I think that's probably our best bet. Chi Lala takes his abilities, trains someone that's like two hundred pounds, and let's mm. see if that guy's Wing Chun can go up against Xu Xiaodong's MMA training. Yes, I think that is a That'd really cool. really good thing for us to look forward to, and I'm gonna plant that in Chi Lala's mind. Yeah. Or, or if Zhu Zha Dong has like a, a, a lower weight class friend, like who, who he would vouch for and be like, yeah, I want to see this guy. Like that could be cool too. Like yeah. friend or I don't know if he trains other fighters or if he just, or not, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Maybe like the that. guy yeah. Chen Qiu Shi, Chen Qiu Shi started taking lessons with Zhu Xia Dong. So Chen Qiu Shi, I think is about Xi Lala's size. So give okay. Chen Qiu Shi like five years. And cool. then I think him and Xi Lala would have a really cool match because they're both thinking people. Going back to the question of Xi Lala too, the one thing I think people always love to criticize Xi Lala is, oh, I don't see any Wing Chun, I don't see any Wing Chun, which is not true. Come on, man. If you mm -hmm. really just looked a little bit at him, he does Wing Chun, you know, there's yeah. some modifications, but it is very Wing Chun heavy. Yeah, even in, like, even with my just couple years of Kung Fu, like, going back and watching, watching Chi La, you see it. So the reason I think his fights resonated with me so much is, like many people, what really got me into martial arts was entertainment. Like, yes, the self-defense aspect is good, the the exercise, the, the way it conditions your mind, those are all great, but... At the end of the day, I grew up even going back to be like even four years old and watching like Power Rangers. And then my brother, my dad and I, we had like a blockbuster Jackie Chan kick for a while. We watched every single Jackie Chan movies. And then even going up into like The Matrix and Kill Bill, like all of these classic martial arts entertainment films. The thing about those is there's a highly choreographed style that you see them use that it's not really real. Like it's like they're the perfectly deflected, like, like, ha, 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 like every single, every single punch, like blocking them, perfectly intercepting when you know that if you've ever like had someone throw a punch combo at you, bat down maybe two, maybe three of those before you're just in trouble. It's so fun to watch when a little bit of that flair appears in Chilala's fighting. That's why it's so fun to watch. And like, you do see like his stance is very upright. He's not tucking his chin. And he, like he like if he wants to get away from it, like he'll he he weaves you know he pulls back a lot um he does a lot of these standing trips that i definitely because i've done a teeny bit of jujitsu too and like i don't remember many standing trips from that i remember there's a lot more you know trying to lock in get the leg get the get the hip moving he has these standing trips that you see in a lot of kung fu um he, he'll do stances that are, are very like wild and and very different he you know he does the chain punches and he does bat down incoming blows, intercept them more often than you would see other fighters. And even like further out, like the, the big, like, you know, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm remembering master who that's what we called him, um, you know, teaching us the, huh, you know, huh, like, and you see him do that sometimes. So that's the thing is like, whether or not he's like using the most efficient or effective style he could be using, he's just so fun to watch. Exactly. And for viewers that don't know, Silala got into Wing Chun through watching the Ip Man movies. So he shares basically what Patrick and I had, which was entertainment. This type of martial arts entertainment played a big role in our lives and how we decided to keep training. Because for me, I was watching Jet Li movies all the time. For you, you were watching Jackie Chan movies and The Matrix and Power Rangers. I mean, Power Rangers, I watched too, right? I love the Power <laughs> Rangers. So, yeah. yeah, it's really cool too because Silala got into Wing Chun through a movie. Of course, it's more a fan, historical fantasy type of movie, but still, he took that and then made Wing Chun as workable as possible, in my opinion. It's life imitating art. It's very interesting to see that. Yeah, um, yeah. And there was that, the problem with Chinese martial arts video that I made, and of course, Xi Lala was featured mm -hmm, in it. And mm -hmm, one yep. of his counterpoints, one of the guys that kind of disagreed with Xi Lala was that older Wing Chun teacher who was like, oh yeah, no, if you want to kill someone, just take a sword, take a knife, you know, Wing Chun for exercise. And there's a really interesting kind of counterpoint. And Xi Lala told me privately, he's like, he was so mad at that guy. He didn't want that guy to be in the documentary. I'm glad they put that guy in the documentary because it gave the documentary more views to pull on. The problem with, with traditional martial arts video is a really interesting one. It makes you think about martial arts and why we do it, what's its purpose, is there a particular purpose it should have or a particular function it should have. The comment you bring up is saying like, 
oh, it's just for exercise. If you want to defend yourself, get a machete. From a self-defense standpoint, that's an incredibly ignorant statement for many reasons. First and foremost, saying get a machete, get a gun. Well, you might live in a jurisdiction where you're not allowed to walk around with a machete. You're not allowed to walk around with a gun. You're in, here in London, you cannot walk around with a locking blade folding knife. You cannot have a pocket knife that the blade locks unless you are have a particular purpose that you need to do that, like you're a, a worker of some kind. So that's just to begin with why that's bad advice. Number two, even if you do live somewhere where you can legally carry a knife or a gun or a machete, it's still better if you also know self-defense techniques because it takes time to draw a gun. It takes time to draw a machete and you might be in a, a self-defense situation and not yet realize it until you're already being hit. So you need to be able to make that space to draw your gun, to draw your machete. And last of all, this is maybe getting a little out there, but in theory, if you do live somewhere where it's normal to defend yourself with a machete, odds are people are gonna be attacking you with machetes and you might have to start you know, learning machete martial arts so that you can be better off in that situation. You covered basically everything I would say to the old yeah. man too. Again, I don't yeah. know how old he is, I just call him old man. But yeah, yeah when I heard that, I said that, does not justify even if your martial art is more of an art than the martial side it still doesn't justify just saying oh yeah well it's not really effective so yeah go get a machete because there's the yeah. martial part of it martial art and this Absolutely. is something that we were talking about um before this interview is that the chinese word for martial art right wushu. so wu means martial and it's funny because the word for dance is also wu, but it's a different character. So sometimes mm. people get that confused. So it's not the mm. character for dance, it's wu, it's martial. But mm. wu shu, the word shu is very interesting because for those of you who know Japanese, shu is translated as jitsu. Like, for example, jujitsu, zhou shu, right? Brazilian jujitsu, bashi zhou shu. Or um, what's another one? like? Kenjutsu, Jian Shu. Mm -hmm. So, if you really were to translate the Chinese word for Wushu, martial art, literally, it would be martial jitsu. The word art is not even really mm -hmm. in the character or the characters yeah. creating the word of martial arts in Chinese. So, that's always a funny yeah. little thing I, I think about. Wushu, where do I see the art in there? And I just see something Shu, like a way or like the skill is a, probably a better way of describing Shu. And then mm -hmm. martial Wu. So where's the art? Somehow it almost like the word martial art is like a mistranslation of what wu shu means to people's minds. In Chinese, nobody thinks wu shu and says, oh yeah, it's mostly dance. But unfortunately, because of how Chinese martial arts has evolved, I think now if you say wu shu in English, or you probably say wu shu, especially if people are knowing you're talking about Chinese martial arts, like Zhonghua Wu Shu, then immediately they think dance, right? So it's kind of <laughs> funny how from the word origin, it's kind of literal meaning to now, it's definitely changed a little based on kind of trends now. In the English word martial arts, that arts part can introduce a lot of ambiguity because in art, in, in, in the English word art could mean like, you know, creative arts, like dance, like painting. It can also just mean a, a way of doing things like, you know, the art of carpentry, the art of metalworking, you know, it can mean a craft essentially. So you have these two possible ways of describing it in English that the same ambiguity, I guess, doesn't exist in Chinese, but it, it, it does make you think though, because like the truth is like, if I was to ask myself, like, what's the main reason I'm doing martial arts now? As much as I do believe there's self-defense value, and I do feel that were I to be in a self-defense situation, having some martial arts training will help. That's not the main reason. The main reason I do it is because I love it, because it's fun, and because it's good for my health. So it's like, in that statement that we both really disagree with, there's a grain of truth. To just discount self-defense entirely, that's that's going too far. Once we're, we have that English translation of art, bringing in that ambiguity, there is a version of it that is an art form based on fighting. And a lot of what I did with Master Who back in high school, that, that's what I feel that was. Working with Master Who, at the time he was jacked. His limbs were rock hard. I have no doubt that like he could, he could take on the whole class of teenagers, no problem. Would he do so well in UFC? I don't know, like he's an older guy and like UFC fighters, they're also quite jacked. So a lot of what we were doing with him was exhibition based, you know, cool, like swinging the bow staff around. I feel like that can still, at least in the English version, fall under that umbrella of martial arts. 
because it's an art, it's an exhibition style based on ideas of fighting and based on a way to represent to represent fighting artistically, you know, as in choreography in plays or films or what have you. Maybe the Chinese need to come up with a new word, whatever would translate into like fighting dance or fighting. I guess it would be like, what well, would it be like woo-woo, woo-woo, fighting yeah, dance? Yeah, it could be woo. That's kind of funny. Yeah, woo <laughs> with the two different characters yeah. that in yeah. Western eyes will be pronounced the same, right? Woo. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it is the same tone too. Woo. That's kind of funny. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Another thought I had about martial arts is that they often have a, a martial value without needing it to actually be used directly in a fight. In the military is across the world. They'll train people in martial arts, not because the likelihood is at all high that in the modern battlefield, they'll have to fight someone, but because it builds up your aggression, it builds up your ability to keep a clear head under stress. And so it can have a peripheral value outside of the direct sense of how to fight someone that's such a good thing i never thought about but exactly yeah. you think about any of the military martial arts program if you are getting down to hand to hand you've done something wrong right because you should yeah. have a main weapon a sidearm knives and stuff so yeah. you lost all of it whoa yeah. but like you said it like, does build you this kind of grit punches are coming to your face you still think that's yeah, what exactly. it does to yeah. people in the military because yeah. on the battlefield the first yeah. time most people, right, they start hearing gunfire <gasps> and it takes them oh, a few yeah. seconds and then you can't freeze mm -hmm. like that. Unless you're like an MP, like I, I imagine like an MP has to know how to like uh, grab and arrest a suspect or like, but it's a, it's a pretty limited function. And, and yeah, like in theory, like maybe someone's doing urban combat and someone comes around a corner and, you know, grabs the barrel of your gun and you got to like, you got to, you know, bring the rifle butt around and whack them in the face. Maybe it probably doesn't happen very often. So another use I see for martial arts is as living history. Because if you look at like HEMA, for example, I don't think many people are doing HEMA because they think like, oh man, one of these days someone's gonna attack me with a 15th century rapier and I'm gonna have to defend myself with a main gouge. It, it's, it's about recreating and understanding how people fought in the past, and like building that connection with the past. So like potentially Eastern martial arts can have that purpose, but from what I understand, like, it's right now, it's not really like that. It's not really very close at all to probably how Kung Fu was done, you know, back when it was a battlefield art. There's even interpretations of certain Kung Fu stances and even Aikido and stuff like that. So looking at Japanese martial arts, it's like, hey, if you add a weapon to this, it actually might make sense. You have to be careful how it works because I don't want to get everyone start debating it, but it's going to happen inevitably. <laughs> but the point is, like you said, a lot of this stuff is kind of more living history and if you don't understand it you might interpret it wrong just like hema like mm -hmm. thank goodness the hema people know you got to do all these techniques with armor and swords right you don't see them trying to do it bare hands oh yeah exactly <laughs> in that same video that same problem with traditional martial arts video they touch on the fact that from a historical perspective they've also been very heavily modified because weapons technology changed combat changed and you start having all of these stories pop up. It's very interesting how Eastern martial arts, and this is not just an outsider's perspective, even from their perspective, they're looked at as mystical, almost magic. And the strange thing about that is that, you know, it, do, it does, it takes away from both the combat effectiveness and the, the value to history. It, it, at least insofar as a history of understanding how people thought. It can be, still be a history of how fighting was depicted in the period right after you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat left the battlefield, but not so much if you really want to know, you know, how did, you know, the armies of China or Japan, how did the people there, you know, fight and live and die? A very analogous situation is Chinese media in general is big on World War II because that's one of the few things that really gets past censors really easily, as long as you don't mm -hmm. portray the Japanese army as too competent, right? Mm -hmm. So the problem with that is, that era of Chinese history starts getting mystified too, much like ancient mm -hmm. martial arts. So you have people throwing up a grenade and blowing up Japanese planes. Like you got something <laughs> right before China really went censorship heavy. There was even a lot of critics, like cultural critics, historians, professors, criticizing a lot of these World War II dramas in China. They're like, this is literally taking history that certain people in China are still alive to talk about truthfully and distorting it to the point where it's an insult to the people that lived through mm. it and so mm. it's like you almost see that with 
the martial arts mysticism. And I love what you said about not only is it an insult to the practical effectiveness, insult's a strong word, but not only is it distorting it from people trying to find its practical application, it's also distorting it from history. So you're actually not even achieving anything, right? Living yeah. history. Why not celebrate the real history? I'm sure, like we said, if we looked at how they use Kung Fu forms in their military formations and stuff, that would be just as interesting and probably yeah. very good to film too. But yeah. because it's always about the flying thing or this one yeah. monk beating up 10 sailors that are American, like mm -hmm. you never get to see the really cool parts of history that we have yet to yeah. really uncover. Yeah, it's like if if like I could give some advice as this complete outsider, it seems like what traditional martial arts needs is it needs to start dividing things more clearly into this is in art form, this is exhibition, this is a artistic representation of fighting, this is living history, this is trying to reconstruct how combat was in the past, and this is this is exercise, and then this is self-defense. I will bring up a few movies that I've seen recently, Chinese movies, that have more sure. tried, attempted to portray the ancient Chinese military better, because up until later on in the Ming Dynasty, Chinese had the most advanced military but if you look at a lot of how these lazy historical dramas and a lot of these movies have portrayed they're always using swords and spears and arrows it's like no the chinese were the first to use guns in their military mm -hmm. but i've been seeing more of that i've been seeing there were some ming dynasty type of dramas movies where the chinese were using guns i'm like ah there we go see that's yeah. an example of how you could positively portray history and martial arts and if you want to make chinese look good you can make china look good that way you know mm -hmm. if you're going to talk about ming dynasty whether they're fighting mongols or fighting the jurchen later or whomever talk about some of that instead yeah. you know there's there was this one horrible movie i saw it was like um when the Qing dynasty was really weak and china was basically half colonized by the european powers there was mm -hmm. one battle against the french where the chinese won and there was this movie about it and it was just so badly distorted about the actual history oh my god <laughs> actually i could go really really deep into this and we're probably going to talk about this in another conversation but yeah. the whole point is there's really cool aspects of chinese history and culture that haven't really made it on the big screen or in mm -hmm. novels or anything and mm -hmm. If the point of all this kind of censoring of Xu Xiaodong or just promoting of Chinese martial arts, et cetera, is to remind people of that stuff, there is all this stuff that's yet to be brought to the West. How did the Ming guns work? How did the nest of bees, like the nest of bee was almost like the first bazooka. How did that work? These are things that you could show and make Chinese culture look good. And it's historical. It's not like just something randomly made up. You mentioned the nest of bees. That makes me think of, I watched, I think it's just called Kingdom. It's a Netflix show about, I think it's 15th century Koreans or 16th century Koreans fighting zombies. And I was so disappointed they did not feature Hwacha at any point. Like, ha, come on, you're fighting zombies. You use the Hwacha against the zombies. That'll be amazing. Uh, missed opportunity. I think this is a perfect time to bring up martial arts in The Last Magi. So tell me more about the martial arts part of the book. Yeah, martial arts does feature in The Last of the Magi. It's not a main thing, but it does make its little appearance. So there's two main characters who use martial arts in The Last of the Magi. And the funny thing is like one is more fantasy and one's more reality. So one character is an ex-Mussad agent who is now working private security. So she is like a total badass. Like the first time we see her fight, she breaks a guy's arm in like a second when he was trying to choke her. So like this very action movie kind of martial arts hero. And then we also have one of the main characters is Jack, who uh, George actually based the character of Jack on me. So it's like, it's weird. I'm like kind of writing myself, but then like writing my friend's version of me along with that. But I, I told him about, you know, I did martial arts in high school. I did fencing in high school too. And Jack is a fencer as well. So there are two occasions where Jack is in a real combat scenario for the first time in his life. And regardless of his training, like he gets sucker punched in the stomach and, you know, has to run away. That's his first experience. His second experience, um, well, his second experience I won't give away. It's too interesting. But I'll say he has another experience where his, his training doesn't quite prepare him for that reality. So that's an important thing to keep in mind in martial arts is that your, your training 
might go out the window the first time you have to use it. And that's the most important lesson about that is because even if that can happen, like that doesn't make it useless. I will always say you're better off having some training. You're better off having martial arts unless it makes you cocky, unless it makes you think you're invincible, because that's going to make you take stupid risks you shouldn't take. And then you're more likely to get hurt. So there, I will say there's no point in martial arts if it makes you more likely to get yourself hurt. If it makes you more likely, I mean, unless you're trying to be a professional or something, but if it makes you more likely in a self-defense situation to do the wrong thing, then you're better off not learning because then you won't do that for sure. Yeah, that's such an important thing to talk about. And I think that's one of my criticisms of certain people. I'm not going to name names in the jiu-jitsu community, especially Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I think from a one-on-one -on -one perspective is one of the best martial arts, but yeah. I've seen many examples of jiu-jitsu guys who kind of take that confidence and go a little bit more and put themselves in danger. There's this one clip I saw. Sure, this guy kind of brushed up against the jiu-jitsu guy and maybe the jiu-jitsu guy felt threatened. Well, do you then take him down in the middle of the road and start grappling with him? I don't think that's the best response. Okay, mm -hmm. he brushed up against you. Did you swing a punch? Even if he said something to you, okay, all right, that's fine. You could de-escalate there, but you take him down into the middle of the road. Cars coming by could hit you guys. You don't know what kind of weapon he has. You see, mm -hmm. that's the problem with even very effective martial arts. If they make you, like you said, either willing to take more risks or cocky for whatever reason, I think you've failed in certain aspects of your training. And I will always mm -hmm. maintain that. Yeah, exactly. Like teaching the right mindset is such an important part of it. And that, that's interesting. Like that's one of those parts that's immortalized in so many films and TV shows and stuff, like the importance of cultivating the right mindset to use martial arts properly. I mean, like what, what you described there, that almost sounds like kind of being a bully to me. Like that's even worse. Like that's, that's worse than just taking a foolish risk. Uh, there, there's a great story um, from a few years back which I think is an example of the right approach or reasonable approach is there, there was an MMA fighter who he was, a guy tried to mug him at gunpoint. And initially the MMA fighter just gave him $30. That's what he had on him, but the guy wouldn't go away. The guy, the guy kept threatening him. Then he, then he punched him. Then he fought, then he fought him. And that was the right move, I think, because, you know, the guy might have still shot him, even though he already gave him his money. But if it's between uh, if it's between some cash and your life, I don't care how, how good of a fighter you are, just give them the cash. <laughs> what's the dollar value of even a 1% chance of dying? Like what's the dollar value? It's, it's pretty high in my opinion, certainly more than I carry with me on a day-to-day -day basis. There's another story I would love to share. And that's just, this is a story from when I lived in Philly. And so I was working at the Fox station in Philly. I remember we covered this story of this guy. He didn't even really have formal jujitsu training, but I mm -hmm. guess he saw it in the UFC or something. So one time he was having a bad day and some guy was mugging the store. He was a customer. And I guess the guy either pointed the gun at him or didn't even threaten him, but the guy just passed by him. So he tried to use the movie jujitsu or the UFC jujitsu on the guy and he actually disarmed the guy. But again, mm -hmm. it was quite a dumb. I actually yeah. simply posted the story on the jujitsu subreddit. And everyone was, thank goodness, talking smack about him too. Mm -hmm. It's like, you don't even really know jujitsu and you're having mm -hmm. a bad day and this mugger is pissing you off. So you're going to take on the mugger. Thank goodness you won, but you're going to take him on on the ground with the gun mm -hmm. flailing all around you. Oh yeah. my God. Like that's one of those yeah. stories. And for a while, I'm like, if this is what jujitsu causes people to do, I'm not going to train jujitsu. Uh, I think yeah, that story exactly. is one of those, like made me not really do jujitsu for a while. But again, I'm not saying jujitsu is bad. It's just, it's so funny what mm -hmm. there's a certain small number of people who train jujitsu who have this kind of, invincible kind of thing there's even that case of the guy he was a jiu-jitsu champion and then you know he this was in brazil or something he took on a guy with a gun and he got shot and he died oh yeah absolutely people bring up i believe it's called detroit urban survival um, which has gotten a lot of flack on social media because he has all these gun disarms he trains people in and again it relates to that show human weapon because they had a krav maga episode of human weapon where they show you the gun disarm and you know, I'm like 16 watching my like, oh, that's so freaking cool. So I grab my airsoft gun. I grab my older brother. I'm like, all right, James, take this gun. All right, I'm gonna put my hands up. And if I move, shoot me. And he's like, oh, you just made my day. And on the first try, I got it. I got, I got the gun from him. I did the classic, you know, displace, you know, leverage, pull it back. But then he's like, let's do it again. 
and he pulled the gun away and shot me. And same thing, I did it with my friends. You know, first try, got away from them, no problem. Second try, they pulled away and they shot me. So uh, the the thing I came up with from that is like, the only time you should attempt a gun disarm is when a 50% chance of dying is an improvement. That's the only time. Yeah, I love how you think in numbers too. I really <laughs> like that. It's true. If yeah. there's even a 1% chance of you really, really mm -hmm. getting hurt and the other 99% chance is okay, you just mm -hmm. lose some money or whatever. Or yeah. the honest truth is, even if you just get punched once in the face, that's mm -hmm. still better than dying. Oh, yeah. Right? So oh, yeah. yeah. I know a story of a guy, he had a knife bowl on him. The guy even punched Ooh. him once in the face, but at least he didn't get stabbed. Oh, so yeah. Was yeah. that a good exchange? Should he, should he feel angry or ashamed that he got punched once by a guy with a knife? No, I think okay. he got out of it fine. Sure, you could have, maybe there was a way to not get punched and you know give him your money, but okay, considering he could have stabbed you in the eye or something, I think you got oh, off yeah. easy. Mm -hmm. I think this is a good time to talk about martial arts in general in the Romani community, because oh, something yeah. you told me that I didn't even realize is that the Romani served in the militaries of a lot of different nations and before nation states of a lot of different kingdoms. Yes, martial history is a huge part of Romani history. When I mentioned that they originated in Rajasthan, one of the leading theories is that they were Rajput warriors. And that's why they were exiled is because the conquering Muslims, obviously, you got to get the military out of there. Or they're going to have a rebellion. The evidence for this is linguistic, actually, because there are a lot of martial terms like sword and dagger that go all the way back to that ancient Hindi, when even more common terms that they might have used, like blacksmithing terms, because they were blacksmiths for so long, those are Greek. So for whatever reason, they started using Greek terms for blacksmithing, but they kept on using those Hindi warfare terms. And so Ian Hancock is a big, uh, he's one of the most prominent Romani scholars, he's Romani himself, and he's a big advocate that he thinks they were Rajput warriors. It's possible other groups got mixed in, like they're smiths, and their entertainers and maybe some diaspora who were living in Iran, you know, they were coming through, they joined on, but the core of it was probably the Rajput warrior. And so this martial tradition seems to have carried over into Greece, into Eastern Europe. There was in one of the Venetian provinces in Greece, there was a military rank called the Drangarius Asiganorum. So Drungarius is a cavalry commander, a Siganorum, that contains the word Sigan. Sigan is what Romani people are called in many countries in Europe. So um, it's, it's almost certain that this was some sort of Romani fiefdom that had its own warriors, its own cavalry that had to serve the Venetian you know, state. In addition to fighting, Romani people also made a lot of weapons and a lot of defenses. They forged cannons, they forged swords, they made the gates and metal fixtures of these two cities in Transylvania, Brasov and Sibiu, which I'm working on a paper about actually. So they like the martial history goes all the way back to the beginning. And then going further, getting into the early modern period, they ended up serving the armed forces of just about every country in Europe. They, they fought in the 30 years war. They were in the British army, the, the Spanish or like what have you, Where, wherever there's been combat, that's been one of the few ways they've been able to find acceptance and been able to make a living. One really famous Romani soldier is John Cunningham. He won the Victoria Cross in World War I. In terms of modern martial arts, boxing is a huge part of the culture for Roma in many countries. Here in the UK, the English branch of Roma, the Romani Chals, they, they are very big on boxing. Um, and then some of the other traveling groups um, that are not necessarily Romani, it's, it's very complicated. But there are other traveling groups, they've picked up on the boxing thing. So it's a huge part of their culture and their history. And um, there's actually a fairly accomplished Romani boxer, Billy Joe Saunders. I would love to get some like fights from him or something. I really want to try and find some footage of Romani child boxers that we could comment on. There's also a very interesting and tragic story of what is known as a Sinti. Um, that's the German branch of Roma, a Sinti boxer who actually was a victim of the Holocaust. He was a champion in his weight class. His name was Johann Trollmann. And when the Nazis came to power, they were not happy about a Roma or any kind of Romani person or a Sinti defeating Germans in the ring. 
they were not happy about that. They considered them untermensch. They considered them subhuman. Their rhetoric about Roma is very similar to the rhetoric about Jews. They said there was a, quote, gypsy question that in need of a final solution. Exact same rhetoric. Part of that was bringing down Johann Trollman. And they directly said to him, we want you to fight again. No sneaky gypsy moves, which was code for you better lose this fight. You better lose this fight. And so being a badass, he shows up, painted his face white and wearing a blonde wig, trying looking like a caricature of an Aryan. And he lost that fight in that guise of this caricature of an Aryan. So things went downhill for him from there on. He actually fought in the German army. He was conscripted. They they forcibly sterilized him. That was they did that to a lot of a lot of Roma got forcibly sterilized. I think I read somewhere that the majority of forcible sterilizations under the Nazis were against Roma. And then even after he'd served in their military and been through that, they still put him in a concentration camp. And when the camp found out who he was and he was this boxer, they organized a fight between him and one of the kapus who they really hated. Like some of these kapos were just like monsters. They were almost as bad as the Nazis themselves. So he won that fight. But then the capo being in charge, he got his revenge and he killed him with a shovel. So that is the tragic story of Johann Trollman. It is inspiring that he did keep fighting. Sounds like there should be a movie about him. So I guess I'll there look it should. up. There should. Might be a documentary. Mm -hmm. um, I'll have to check it. There it is, yeah. So if we wanted to find the book that you guys have written, where can we find it? It's on Amazon right now. And we're going to be launching on additional platforms. So probably when this comes out, you'll also be able to get it on Barnes and Noble. And uh, we'll be launching a website soon. So you can just like, you know, throw the link in the description. It'll be down there. Cool. So for those of you watching, you'll follow some links in the description and pin comments, and then you guys will find the book. What is next for you guys besides publishing this book on more platforms? Are you guys going to write a sequel? Are you guys going to write something else? Tell me about this. This is book one of the trilogy. Oh, so, yeah. And each book in the trilogy traces a different part of Romani history. So you have this first one touches very much on World War II and the Holocaust. Book two is going to focus on Roma slavery. And the third book is going to go more into ancient origins and these ideas that are popular among Romani people in their culture about biblical times actually. So very interesting bits of history and mythology all woven together. I am really excited by that. And I think that makes this trilogy extra cool because it's almost like intersecting, different intersecting mm -hmm. branches coming together. You know, our goal for it is that we want it to make people interested in Romani history. And it's great to hear that like it did make you so interested in Romani history. I'm a history person, but part of it, I think I give a lot of credit to you guys. You guys wrote it in such a cool way. I love that you yeah. incorporated some language from the Romani. So oh, yeah, yeah. I haven't looked up that one word, but it seemed like it was a word to describe non-Romani people. So like there's certain things that Gajay, make you want to yeah. search, right? And that mm -hmm. you guys did yeah. a really good job with that. There was this Chinese American who wrote a book called Donald Duck and he kind of did the mm -hmm. same thing. He incorporated some Chinese language into it. I don't know why that book never really took off, but it was a good book. Like out of mm -hmm. all the good books that, were written by Chinese Americans to represent kind of Chinese American culture. That was a good one. So it was the same thing. You got to plant little things for people to kind of look more into. And that's what you guys did really well. Much like martial arts, a lot of times what gets people into history is entertainment. A lot of us take for granted how important history is to a people. Most of us, we grow up with our histories. We grow up learning our histories in school. And we can use those histories to understand the world, to understand why things are the way they are. So without Romani history, and Europe is pretty much, it's not really a thing. Uh, Spain very recently mandated that they need to teach Romani history for the uh, the Spanish Roma known as Gitanos. Um, but in the rest of, of Europe, like I said, like you're more, you're more likely to find someone who knows about African American slavery than you'll ever find someone who knows about Romani slavery. George has said he's never met anyone in Europe who knew that Roma were slaves. He doesn't know anyone to think about that. So when you look at the situation of Romani people today, where there's so much marginalization, so much poverty, um, and unfortunately the things that come with that high crime rates, you know, um, negative attitudes towards society in general, when you don't have the history to understand how it all came about, people tend to just jump to racist assumptions. Kind of paradoxically, when you know what the past is, it gives you greater power to change things for the future.
because it lets you know that things haven't always been this way and they don't always have to be this way moving forward. Exactly. So true. And for those of you watching, this is another reason why I love history so much and why all of you should go and if any of you, seriously, if any of you are watching talking about history, we have a platform. So, <laughs> man, Patrick, this was such a great little talk, and I'm sure we will bring you back. So for viewers that are watching, leave your questions, whether about Patrick's archaeology stuff or about the book or about martial arts. We'll definitely do more talks with Patrick. So, Patrick, thank you so much. Thank you.